Shamrock Sports has hit the road. Three New Jerseyans could have gone anywhere in the world today, but we decided to come right here to the Mayo Invitational. Shamrock Sports starts now. Welcome inside the Duncan Student Center. No, welcome inside Mayo Field here at Loftus Sports Complex on the campus of Notre Dame. Chris Brick alongside Liz Perna and JJ Post. We've got a lot to talk about today. We're here, we're here at the track field. It's a, a beautiful weekend for some track and field events. But to start us off today, we're going to talk about some women's basketball, most notably a top 10 upset, top 5 upset earlier this week against NC State. JJ, what were your thoughts on that game? I mean, it's kind of the win that you felt Notre Dame women's basketball been inching towards, but they hadn't gotten on it. They came close against Duke, you know, a heartbreaking loss. They had a chance to win in the final, you know, 30 seconds, gave the ball away, suffered a loss. You know, they had games where it felt like they were coming close to a state win, but they couldn't get over the top. NC State was that game. It was a game which they came out, they played a top three opponent, they had a first place vote too, and they just floored them all game. NC State came into it a little bit at the end, and the game close, it came down to a last shot for NC State. They missed it though, and it was the win that Notre Dame needed to kind of really make a statement that this is Neil Ivey's team. They're proving on a not just a linear basis now, on a basis they're going right to the top. They're not trying to be, you know, a team that missed the tournament last year. They're going to be a Sweet 16 this year. This is a team that wants to compete for the highest level immediately, and I think they're showing that. You know, while in the early season it looked like they had potential to that, now it's showing tangible results. Liz, what did you think about that game? I thought it was a standout game for Maya Dodson this year. Uh, she had a game high 20 points, and this was her 10th straight double-digit game. So I thought she put in a really solid performance for the Irish. Um, they fought back well after some injuries at the end of the first half, and they really showed their new this game. Yeah, it really feels like the, the pieces of this Notre Dame women's team are coming together. Player, You mentioned Dodson. She's really playing up to what she was built up to be transferring here. Olivia Miles, I mean, who deserves this? She's a freshman champ more than her. I mean, she is just insane at such a young age. She is going to be a staple for this program for years to come. Sam Brunel played well the other night. Just a lot of different pieces coming together for this Notre Dame women's team. I think, you know, you mentioned it, JJ. If they could beat the number three team in the country, they – they can beat anyone virtually at, on any given night. It's just about performing up to how they think they can. And yeah, I mean, Neil Ivey really done a good job developing the program. We mentioned kind of where we think this team is going. What What are your guys' projections for the rest of the season? Liz, we'll start with you. I just think that this this showing how aggressive we were on the rebounds, how few turnovers or bonuses we had. We kept them to eight turnovers, and they've been averaging 15.6 per game against a pretty stiff schedule. Uh, with NC State and the fact that we know how to play tight, I think if we just keep that going and we stay this aggressive, there's no one we can't beat. Yeah, and you said it, Chris. You know, if they, they can beat the number three team, they can beat anyone, and they're going to get plenty of chance to do that. They get two games against Louisville, the number four team. They're going to move up to number three now, presumably with that NC State loss. They also get uh, Georgia Tech, who's a top twenty team on the road. You know, these are games that you know Notre Dame will have more chances to really make their case, not just for a top twenty team, because I believe they're number twenty three right now, but top ten team even. If they head out of this ACC schedule, first, second, third, in a very tough Atlantic Coastal Conference, as well as multiple top fifteen wins. They have a very strong case to be one of the top seeds come the NCAA tournament time. So I think that, on a more holistic view, is where you want to see this Irish team getting those for future statement wins, getting those future resume builders. But also on a more individual level, you just want to see how this team grows together. You mentioned Olivia Miles, a player that you know you could see the pinch early on, but it felt like she hadn't been hitting her shots. She was getting to the right places, but the ball wasn't falling. Now, last five games, she's averaged 19 points a game. She's really starting to come together, and you know the creative aspects of the Miles game too cannot be understated. She had the behind the back assist against Virginia Tech. She can set up plays for her teammates. She can finish herself. It's a game that I think it's a team that I think really relies on their freshman talent as much as they do their experience talent, which I think says a lot both about what this team will be going forward and how this team will grow as the year goes on. Because players like Miles, Sonia Citron, they have players that have only grown as the year has gone. They're not getting worse. They're getting better, and they're going to look to peak right when it matters most at the end of this month, heading into March. Yeah, I agree with you, but. I, I want a definitive statement for you guys. I want a, a, a clip that you can post and say, I told you so a month from now. So I want, where are we finishing in the ACC tournament? How far, or how far are we getting in the ACC tournament? How far are we getting in the NCAA tournament? JJ, well, I know you're a big predictions guy. We'll start with you. All right. Well, you know, I like making realistic predictions. But what would I be right. if not a Notre Dame home? Right. We're going to win the ACC. We're going to make the final four of the NCAAs. And Olivia Miles is a top ten player in college basketball as a freshman. Book it. <laughs> Book it, Liz. What are your thoughts? I, I can't disagree with a prediction like that, so I'm I'm piggybacking off that one, and I would say that we're not doubting the Irish in the Loftus Sports Center right now. 
there's no bias here at Shamrock Sports, but <laughs> very lofty expectations for our women's basketball team. But onto another team that um, has kind of a bit of a changing of the guard, if you will. Uh, Notre Dame Volleyball hired Salima Rockwell as their new head coach, someone who's looking to really build the program up, rebuild it to its, its former glory. Our own Jacob Irons got an interview with her. Hi, everybody. Jay Irons here. No, not for a fall sports recap, but I'm here to talk about one of our new entities with Shamrock Sports, and that's Coaches Conversations. I'm going to be sitting down with some of the best coaches and biggest coaches here at Notre Dame to talk about what's going on within their program for the upcoming season or what's going on in the offseason. So my first one is Coach Salima Rockwell. We sit down with her, and to give you a preview what comes out on Monday, our full-length interview comes out on Monday on the YouTube channel. I'll give you a two-minute glimpse right here on Shamrock Sports. So check it out. Now let's get into some clinical questions here. You were announced as a new head coach on January 6th. And then 11 days later on January 17th, you hire Craig Dyer to become your associate head coach. Then yesterday, as we speak on February 1st, you hire Sarah Matthews, both who are in their own right considered some of the top coaches in the country right now. What are you doing to get them on your staff? I want to know your pitch because you're selling Notre Dame really well to some of the best in volleyball right now. I would love to hear the Salima Rockwell pitch, if I may. Well, it's simple. <laughs> no more I don't think it's that simple. Fun. We're going to win. Like, it'll be fun and we're going to win. I mean, that's it. Boom. No, I, you know, I, and I've known, I actually, I'm very fortunate. I've known Craig Dyer for years and years, 20, 20 plus years. Um, I've seen him work. I've seen what he's done uh, on the men's side, winning championships. Like he, he's done it all. And I knew and it's something that he and I had talked about for years. You know, I think when you're a coach, you kind of always have your people. You think about who would I want to bring on board? And for him as well, if he ended up in that position, you know, we kind of all, already always talked about that. So I knew I was going to go for it and see what happened. And, <laughs> and I'm really good friends with his wife and she's one of my best friends. So try, oh, I had a nice little, you had the voice in, you had the voice in her, his ear. You're like, come on, like. Salima yeah, has called you. Exactly. And it's not, it's not simple. It's never a simple move. You know, it's hard leaving teams. It's hard leaving programs. Like it's really a tough decision, you know, and even for someone like Sarah Matthews, the same thing. I I've known her for a long time and, and she's done the same thing. And I, what I really want for our team, for myself and our team, I want to surround myself by people I know that I trust and can, can train my team at the highest level and, and that the volleyball world and community respects. Like, and that's what I have in Sarah and, and Craig. And that's what I'm most excited about. I don't have to worry about them. I don't have to think about them. They, if I'm gone, they can absolutely step into anything. If a phone rings, either one of them can pick it up. So I don't know. I think they knew that coming in, that we would have pretty good synergy. And uh, so I don't know. That wasn't my pitch, but that's why. <laughs> As I alluded to in the opening, We'll have the full 15-minute conversation on Monday coming out on the YouTube channel. So for Shamrock Sports, I'm Jacob Irons. I'll send you back to the desk. Thank you very much, Jacob. And thank you, Salima Rockwell, for becoming an honorary member of Shamrock Sports. It's, it's an honor to have you. We talked before about what I would say is our kind of the, the stable relationship with the women's basketball team. Now we move on to what I would say I'd describe as a little bit more of a, an unhealthy relationship that we have with the men's basketball team. This week, a very up and down week. Duke comes into town, into South Bend. The, everyone's hyped up. This is the moment we're gonna beat another top 10 team. And we got run out of the stadium in that one. But then, so then all hope is lost. We travel down to Miami. We have not been very good on the road this season, but we pull off an upset against one of the best teams in the ACC, JJ. What have your thoughts been on this volatile week in Notre Dame's men's, men's basketball? Yeah, I mean, cards on the table, this team doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. there's no use trying to, like, quantify with analytics because they don't make sense on an analytics uh, perspective either. So, like, I won't use numbers to try to, you know, usually I like to put some stats up here, you know, that'll make sense to try to make things a little more database. It doesn't work. This team's, like, 140th in defensive efficiency, yet they held Duke to 55 points and put up 40 themselves. It doesn't make sense, and I'm done trying to make sense of it because we just ride the way of this team because I think what they thrive off of is just being, you know, a fun group. This is not the most talented Notre Dame team Mike Bray has ever had, but they are a team that plays better than the sum of their parts. You know, that Miami game, I think, really shed a lot. Because on the show last week, we had uh, Jacob and John talking about the, the upcoming schedule. The consensus we got came to, while Duke is the headline event, the game that, you know, everyone was in Purcell for, the crowd was in a frenzy. You know, that, that was a big game, 
But Miami was the realistic win this team needed had. You know, the game that you go on the road against the team that was number one in the ACC, you know, whether they're more talented or not, they had the win over Duke. So this was the top dog in the ACC, and you get a practical good win over them on the road. It stands out on the resume, not in the way that a Duke would win would, uh, you know, a top five team at home, obviously, you know, you love to see that. But I think the win on the road against a good Miami team really says a lot about what this team's intentions are in terms of bouncing back from, by all intentions, a really bad Duke defeat, because, you know, I think this team, I, I believe we shot 30% from the field, a lot of that was in garbage time against Duke. You know, just really a flat-out terrible offensive performance. I think it says a lot. They came to the Miami game, they played, you know, their own game style of basketball, they played efficiently, they fed Paul out the ball down low, they let him cook, and I think this says a lot that this team was able to, you know, rebound from such a bad loss and come into the Miami game, a game that they needed to win to keep that NCAA tournament hopes alive, and get the win there. And now, you know, you see how you build off that Miami game, see if you can build another winning streak, try to get some momentum going, because really the schedule for the rest of the year, you know, it's very winnable. You know, obviously it's the ACC, you know, it's always going to be hard for a team like Notre Dame that doesn't have a top five roster from sound. But, you know, you look at the schedule going forward, you know, you don't have a lot of Ken Tom top 40 teams in there, you don't have a lot of tournament teams in there, you got to win out against the schedule, you've got to beat the Boston College World that we lost by 15 too early in the season. you got to get a rebound win there. you got to beat Pittsburgh, you know, because, you know, we got struggled to beat them earlier season. you got to get a statement win at home there. So I think it's pockmarked with games that you think, you look at this and you think you got to win this, not because, you know, you're lower than them on paper and you need to get a, you know, an upset, but more because you need to show that you're a team that can't just upset good teams, but one that can hold their own against the lower opposition as well. Yeah, well said. Liz, what are your thoughts? I would describe this team as, you know, you talk about the luck of the Irish. Sometimes the luck is there and sometimes it's not. And Duke, it just was not there. I mean, nothing was going in for the Irish. Not, nothing from out of the out of the paint, inside the paint. Nothing was going in. They shot 28% from the field and they were out-rebounded by 15. And they just were not looking for the rebounds because Duke's transition game was so strong, they would just shoot and try to get back just to stop the Duke attack. So it, it wasn't our best game at all. And I think that it's not necessarily representative of how well this team has played this year so far. And I think if we go out with the season strong, we went out the rest of our schedule, we'll be in a really good place come tournament time. Yeah, it's the, the Duke game is interesting because you mentioned, like, if you told me before that game, oh, Notre Dame's going to hold Duke to 55 points, I would have said, all right, Notre Dame's got a pretty good shot. But then if you had told me that Matt Zona and Jarek Nesny are going to outscore Dane Goodwin, I would have been like, okay, we're screwed. Um, but that's the way that game went down. And, but, you know, I think that Duke game was really the first time all season where I watched this Notre Dame team and I said, okay, there's clearly a, a huge talent gap here where, you know, it's it, it, all Duke's five stars, guys, Paulo Vaccaro, like, we don't have anyone on our roster that can guard him straight up. He's a, he's a, I, I would say he's the best player in this, in this upcoming draft class. Uh, I think he's going to be a star in the NBA. Like he, Paul Atkinson, Nate Lashevsky, those guys just aren't big and physical enough to stop a guy who's, what, 6'10", 6'11", and can shoot from the outside, who can create his own shot. Like, they, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but what I do have a problem with is scoring 14 points in the first half of the game. Um, that is just, you know, that's unacceptable. Shot 19% from the floor in that first half. You just you can't beat the number nine team in the country when you perform that way. However, when we went on the when Notre Dame went on the road against Miami, we really showed things up. And I think it's kind of it kind of shows that I think talent wise in the ACC, Duke's at the top, and a lot of other teams are in that next tier, including Notre Dame, where it feels like anybody can really beat anybody on any given night. You know, Duke's not Duke's not invincible either. I just think they are kind of a, a tier above everyone else in terms of talent. Um, but I just think that, you mentioned it, JJ, that it seems like winning out is kind of necessary, but I think it's also very doable, at least in the regular season. So it'll be interesting to see where this team goes forward. But I also want to talk about the man at the helm, Mike Bray, who, you know, he's he's one of the most electric coaches in ball, college basketball, I would say, but a guy who's been on the hot, hot seat in previous years due to, we have, you know, better name hasn't made the NCAA tournament in, in a few years. Um, but what are your thoughts on his status going forward? Liz, we'll start with you. I think that, I mean, the last time Purcell Pavilion was sold out was the Duke game in 2019, and objectively, no one was there to watch Notre Dame. They were there to see Zion and Williamson, and this time, they were there for Notre Dame, and I think that speaks to how well he's put this team together, how Notre Dame's basketball team has gotten so much stronger, and I think that's largely a testament to him, especially, as you said, this is not our most talented team, and I think the fact that He's pulled them all together, made the best use out of all of them, and made them a team that people want to come see and come watch. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you started off the intro to this Met Basketball segment by saying the relationship is a bit confusing, it's a bit wonky, but this year it's working. I think that's about, you know, perfectly described Mike Bray as well, because, you know, as a coach, you know, as a guy, we'll start, you know, it's, it's hard not to love Mike Bray. He gets the students involved. He's a passionate guy. He clearly loves this school. He loves this job. He wants to make the in the SB, and he's a great guy all around. He can tell the players love him. You can tell they want to, you know, play for him. And I think that shows on night-to-night basis on the court. But it also shows in games like Duke, you know, there are deficiencies in this coaching that really can get exposed at times. You know, you can't get, you can't, you know, falter under the home lights at home. Like, the whole point of having a big environment is it bolsters you, not weakens you. And I felt like that Notre Dame team really kind of crumbled in having a loud, roushous environment per cell for the Duke game. And that's, you know, that that's on some level the players, if, you know, it's a team that is, you know, headlined by Blake Wesley, a freshman, you know. But other than that, you know, it's a pretty experienced roster. And, you know, Bray as a coach has to make sure the players are ready for games like this. But overall, I think, you know, this is a team that has rebounded nicely. You know, the expectations weren't exactly sky high. Coming off a rough 2020, really, you know, in the long, in the last team team, it's been a rush, you know, rough three, four years from here. They haven't made the playoffs. Uh, the playoffs. They haven't made the NCAA tournament since, I believe, 2017. You know, so there is a level, you know, a stretch of, you know, kind of underperformance by Bray, you know, under recruiting, underperformance of the court. It's been a bad four years of Jack Lewis, this Notre Dame program. I think this is the year where he's kind of turning it around, but I think it's going to be more what he does next year when you lose potentially Prentice, when you lose potentially Paul Atkinson, and you have to transition into the year. You have to get JR uh, and Zona involved somehow. You have to figure out how to make Blake, Blake Wesley stay another year. You get him to be the star man, you know, because he's been kind of in a slump in recent years. It has kind of masked off by the fact that they're not winning so much. But Wake West, Blake Wesley in the last few games has not been himself. So I think he's got to figure out how to find consistency in his players. He's got to figure out how to navigate a young roster into another tournament spot. Because this year, you know, experience is one of the best things that college basketball. This is a team that starts four to five seniors in every single night, with the exception of Wesley. I think uh, what's going to say a lot about Coach Bray is how he gets the team next year when he loses three or four of those seniors. How he gets a younger team through the ACC season, how he, you know, matures the talent he's brought in, and how he adapts the talent like J.J. Starling that he's bringing in the next class, making sure they can get involved from year one. Yeah, that's a good point about J.J. Starling. The one thing that Mike Bray does have on his side right now is that he has a good recruiting class coming in, and if Blake Wesley sticks around, Notre Dame's going to, they're going to wreak some havoc next year, I think. Um, but I mean, just talking about Mike Bray in terms of, uh, like, kind of, kind of just how I see him on the sidelines, I don't really care about right now, like, how he coaches the players. It is insane watching Mike Bray during a Notre Dame home basketball game because in the second half of games, he will spend more time like hyping the crowd up than he will talking to his own players. It is wild to watch. You look at him on the sideline. After any important main Notre Dame basket, he's just out there. He's indicating to the leprechaun legion, like, let's go, get hype, get up. And then after the game, he's running into the crowd to, to like go with all the fans. And, I mean, I, I commend him for it. I think, that, I think that it's electric. But also, Mike... There's a pandemic. Like, stay away from us. We're disgusting. Um, but it, it's it's awesome to watch him kind of fuel up the, the energy of the student section. It's an ability that I feel like most coaches don't bring to the table. It really would be the most Notre Dame ending this season for us to get put on suspension by Mike Bray uh, coming in the student section after a big home win to clinch the ACC and then our tournament getting uh, postponed by a COVID cancellation. That would be, while I don't want to happen, extremely emblematic of this entire season. Really. Yeah, yeah, it would be. It would, the, the, I feel like it, the best way to describe this Notre Dame team is chaotic neutral. I think that's <laughs> accurate. Um, but moving on, we, we're here at Mayo. We at Mayo Field for a reason. The Mayo Invitational this weekend. Liz, what are your thoughts on the Mayo Invitational? Mayo Invitational, we got a lot of great teams coming to Notre Dame this weekend. Uh, events are going to continue Sunday, nope, Saturday, at 10 a.m. Events will continue Saturday at 10 a.m. And uh, it's free and open to the public. You just got to come with your mask and you can watch all the exciting stuff that's about to go down. JJ, what's your 40 time? Not as high as it sure was the freshman year when I tracked and tell you that much. Okay. Volleyball, it's a fun sport to play. does not help your time in the 50-yard dash, the 40-yard dash, any of that. Got a lot slower. A bit better if my hands with the ball. You know, a you know, little bit of ball control, a little bit of serving, a little bit of setting. Not good for 40. Okay, Liz, you think you can beat JJ in a race? I club do, soccer. I, I mean, you, I, I would hope you could. I do think I could. What does it say about the state of Notre Dame club soccer if you can't beat me in a race? I'll true. say that much. Uh, I will say back-to-back -back national qualifiers, so... Yeah, I am, I am working to get my 40 time under eight seconds, but you know that's that's a time that's a, a mission for another day. Uh, but this has been a great show, guys. It's been a blast to be here on location at the Mayo Field here at the Loftus Sports Complex. So for JJ Post and Liz Berna, I'm Chris Frick. This has been Shamrock Sports. Make sure to check us out on Instagram. Thank you for watching.